This is A Voice, a podcast with Dr. Gillian Kayes and Jeremy Fisher. This is A Voice. Hello and welcome to This is A Voice podcast, episode five, The Stories Behind the Stories. So what's the topic today? Well, can I just say that my hands are in prayer mode (laughs) because one of the joys of living in the countryside our uh, noise is off and the noise off for most of the morning which has held up our recording has been a buzz saw yes uh, we have a river running through the garden and just across the river is a, a <laughs> veritable forest and uh, the environment agency are out today cutting some of the forest down and today they chose to be right outside our door lovely yeah so okay. if, you, if you hear um sawing it's because that's what's happening uh, oh and by the way you might also hear chickens as well they are on a tea break right now yeah Long may their tea break continue. Fingers crossed. Okay, so we thought it would be interesting to talk about our books. And in fact, we're going to talk about the first two of our books. Yes. And uh, a little bit about the process of writing, what that's like, and how we came to write the books. So, so the I'm first, the saying first, the first two The first two are... The first two are. Uh, singing and the actor, and if you're looking on YouTube, uh, we actually have the books here. We have That's the, the old first edition. Original silver cover with a lady in the golden top hat. Uh, who is not me, by the way. No, people did think it was you, didn't they? It was, I was very flattered. Similarities. Um, not um, a dancer, Julia. That's the second edition there. Yeah. And the second edition is the black cover. That's Jane with Horrocks. Jane Horrocks um, doing that's cabaret. cabaret. That's whereas right. this one is chorus, chorus line. line. Yes. And as Jeremy said, I don't dance, so it definitely wouldn't be me. No. So show us uh, successful singing okay, auditions. Okay, successful singing auditions. Uh, by the way, uh, singing in the act of first edition was two thousand, mm. and then second edition was two thousand and four. And successful singing auditions came between the two. And this is the one which is the sort of ivory white cover with three coloured photographs of somebody with a clipboard holding, um, doing basically doing an audition in front of the curtain. Mm. And this one came out in 2002. So we had two years between each one. Yes. So we're going to talk about those books, why we wrote them, what the stories are behind them, what happened, what a, all the, the reception that they got as well, which was really interesting. <laughs> Um, <laughs> as in the Chinese version of interesting, which is, it was an interesting time. Um, so let's start with yours then. Singing yes. and the actor. Yeah, I, actually I'd like to talk about how it came about because I think I wrote my first book when I was 44. So um, it sort of came out of the blue and... Um, I think this is useful for any of you to know who are perhaps aspiring writers, you've got something to say. I'll be honest and say I'd never even thought of writing a book. But someone that I was working with was an editor for ANC Black. She was worked in the music department. Mm. Anna Sanderson, who's since become um, a lifelong friend, actually. Hi, Anna. And uh, Anna was having singing lessons with me. And one particular day we were working on Sondheim's I remember, and I was talking about the process of how you put words together with the music in singing, because Anna's um, musical background had been, I think, on the bassoon and the violin and and keyboard as well. And she'd done a pretty much mainstream um, classical training and had done a a degree at uh, Cambridge University. And I was explaining that the way... um, the text is lifted off the page for an actor who sings is very different from the way that a singer sings. And as a result of that, and it could have even been six months later or a year later, a book had been submitted to ANC Black by somebody else, I don't know who it was, uh, as a, you know, a sort of a, a pitch. And Anna had been asked to look at it, you know a bit about singing. And apparently she said, hmm, why don't you ask someone to write a book who actually knows about the voice? Uh, Which was very kind of her. And that was when they approached me. So that's how it came about. I was actually didn't know that story. You didn't know that that story? story. Yes, indeed. Ask someone who actually knows. (laughs) And uh, that was very nice. And we were both very lucky, in fact, because we had Anna as our editor for both books. And she was fabulous. She's great. I think in terms of 
the editorial process, it really, really helps to have someone who understands when, where you're coming from. Can we say how important having an mm-hmm. editor is? Mm. So important. Having a really good editor, and, and the thing is that Anna, because she already had a musical background, mm. and she was having singing lessons as well, she understood enough about the process, she understood enough about what we were talking about, to be able to guide us in what we were saying, in both books, in fact, mm. um, but not to interfere too much with the whole writing process. Mm. It was very is a very fine hand she had it was really good and actually i will say hats off to anc black at the time because the um my main editor was somebody else in the drama department and she was the one that commissioned the work initially but when it came to going through the editorial process she very sensibly handed it over to Anna to do most of the work because mm. she said, I know nothing about music mm. and this is about singing and singing is about music. Mm. And that's how it came about. So, yeah, a big thank you to our friend Anna for um, putting up with us in various uh, editions and various uh, other books that we wrote. And we eventually wrote... Um, Singing, singing Express, Express series. series with her. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to writing, the actual writing of the book, oh. which was interesting. We were uh, living in my flat, which was a one-bedroom flat on a council estate, um, which was basically like a set of The Bill, if you've seen The Bill. Mm. It was. It could have been a quite a scary place. But a typical uh, kind of inner London, you know, high-rise. Yeah. And so there wasn't really anywhere for Gillian to sit and write. Um, so... What did I do? We set up in the kitchen. Yes. We had a large kitchen. Yeah. So we, we set up a workstation. It was pretty much my first computer, by the way. Um, I didn't even start to learn a computer, uh, how to work on a computer till my 40s. So there I was in this little workstation in the corner of the kitchen. I basically locked you in the kitchen and said you're not coming out until the book's written. Uh, I typically had that writer's block, you know. I'd I'd started, I'd written down ideas. I'd submitted a synopsis, which they loved, by the way. They said it was pretty much the best synopsis they'd ever received. And then I was stuck, you know. I was totally on the pot. I could not (laughs) get writing. (laughs) So tell them what you did. Oh, I locked him in the kitchen. I, mm. I, I said, you know, fine, you know, I will do everything that's required to run the house, to run the business, but you are staying in that kitchen and you are not coming out until that book is finished. Thou shalt sit in the kitchen and write. Yep. Is, you know, that was the edict. So this and, was 1999 when you actually started writing that book. Mm, yeah, I'd done a little bit. It was about two and a half years from start to finish. Right, right. Yeah. 98, 99. And I, I think... You know, writer's block is real because you have the idea, you have the concept and then you're sitting down with that, you know, blank piece of paper or that the blank word document and suddenly everything dries up. Mm. And I think in the end, what we talked about was just write what you do. Mm. I think also it's the it's the business of because you there's often a lot of thoughts going around in your head and trying to Mm. get them down on paper is. Paper is a clarification process, but it's also very complex because you have a lot of thoughts that have emotions and images and all sorts of things, and you have to get it down into the written word. Mm, and mm. that makes it quite a challenge to get something clear enough. Because all of, always when we write books, our aim is to get something clear enough that you can read the words and do the exercise. That, so we try to make it as unambiguous as possible. And that's part of the challenge. And I think just sitting mm, and mm. writing, even if you're writing rubbish, is good. Because often in the rubbish, there'll be something that will come out. Something that will come out, yeah. Um, and I will say, I remember when, when the book first came out, that one of my students who I trained at the East 15 Acting School said, oh, I love the book because it's in the first person. And I just feel like you're talking to me. And it was... I didn't actually know that it was a big decision, that it was a brave decision to write in the first person. To me, it seemed really obvious, this is what I do. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, I had people contact me and say, oh, that was very brave that you did that. Yeah, apparently that was really unusual. Mm. It wasn't normally mm. done to yeah. write a, a study book like that in the first person. Yeah, and retrospectively, as a researcher, of course, you don't do that. Or if you do, you kind of declare uh, why you're doing it in a certain part of the research. Mm. So it isn't just about I. Anyway, um, yeah, I think one of the reasons why the book was successful was because I did have a process. I started to work with actors pretty much by accident. 
in the 1980s, people who taught singing to actors nearly always came from a classical singing background, which I did. And often what happened in those days was that if you were working on singing with an actor and you came from that background, all of those classical exercises and that classical music approach would turn an actor off because an actor is inspired by text and by physicality. Yeah, and thought process. Yeah. Yeah. So I can tell you that when I gave my very first lesson at the East 15 Acting School, there were 20, you know, actors. Can I say shit? Shit scared actors in the room. They didn't want to sing. Most of them didn't want to be there. And I had taken Cole Porter's In the Still of the Night because I thought this was a nice light song that I would be able to do with them. And um, it had an F in it. I'm talking about F5 here. Well, two thirds of the people couldn't sing it. Up went those hands. This is too high. This is too high. Well, you must understand that I trained as a soprano. The idea that we couldn't sing an F was really weird to me. Uh, it later became one of my catchphrases at um, the college. Everybody has an F. <laughs> you haven't heard that one I before either, that. have you? I don't know. So uh, one of the things that I think forced me to develop a process as a teacher was... First of all, working with people, many people who couldn't sing. Mm. You know, you learn how to teach by teaching people who can't do it. Mm. My generation of people who went for singing lessons, by and large, if you went for singing lessons, you kind of could already do it. You could sing on pitch. A lot of my people couldn't uh, at that college. And you had a voice. People could hear that you had a voice. Well... Uh, it was. It's very different when you work with people who don't already have those skills. I think the interesting thing about working with actors is they do have skills. They mm. have a lot of skills that are to do with characterisation and text and wording and, and uh, emotion voice. and voice. Mm. And this is the really interesting bit is where the spoken voice work overlaps with the singing voice work mm. and where it doesn't. So where did you go? I mean, what happened for <laughs> you to to actually start to understand that? Well, I very sensibly started going into the voice lessons. I was very lucky uh, that while I was at East 15, Andrew Wade, who later went on to be head of, um, head of voice at the RSC, was teaching voice. And we had a very kind of open dialogue between the teachers at that college at the time. It was quite a wacky college. They did some really interesting things in the 1980s. And Andrew said, well, look, shouldn't we be talking to each other because we're both working with the voice? It's one voice. And I thought, yeah, he's right. You know, it is one voice. And uh, what is the point of my doing these scales? Mm. So we literally sat in on each other's classes and we began to share ideas because Andrew, having trained at Rose Bruford College as a voice teacher, had a process. And that was when I realised that us classical singers who'd learned in the um, Master Apprentice model, we didn't really have um, a process. Mm. We just learned what our teachers had taught us and that's what we passed on mm. and I'm so grateful that I had that time it was a very fruitful time for me and I tell you what as well as working with people who can't do it teaching you to be a great teacher working in groups forces you to create structure mm. and it was really that that enabled me to write a book and to purpose the information in the book towards the things that an actor needs to do the songs that they need to sing so that it it wasn't a book just about you sing these scales and you do these routines and your voice will magically develop i think i mean it was groundbreaking at the time mm. and um it's an interesting thing doing stuff that that people tell you is groundbreaking because at the time you do it and you go well obviously this is what i'm going to do mm. and although there are references to other people and there are references to other other styles mm. and other other genres if you like um this is basically your information and this is your process and this is how you do it and it's so mm. obvious to 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 us when we write something that this is how it works 
Um, and other people come along and go, well, that's extraordinary. Mm. I think it's fair to say, I'm going to stick my neck out and say that I don't think anybody had written a book about singing for, singing for that particular community mm. in that way at that time. And uh, I still kind of stand by the the learning process that's in the book. I just want to say a little bit about um, the Estill voice qualities that mm. are described towards the end of the book. Anyone who's read uh, Editions 1 and Editions 2 will know that there were quite significant changes between them. It was about, what was it, about a quarter of the book you changed between one and, one mm, and the next? More than I was meant to, <laughs> yes. When, when you do a second edition, you're supposed to just sort of delicately update it slightly. And Gillian went, no, no, let's, let's do some rewrites. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> that was you well over the call of duty. Uh, in the UK, in the 1990s, um, singing training was very dominated by classical values. And as I said earlier, that typically turned actors off singing. One of the things that was useful about our Estill background from mm. the early 1990s up until the end of the 90s was the idea that there were different voice qualities that people could make. And it was... I used those in the book because I saw them as a way of legitimising sounds that uh, actors will want to make and that as a classical singer I'd been trained to avoid. Well, the classical singing is very much about voice beautiful. Mm. Even when you are uh, in extreme emotions, it's still about, you know, the sound of your voice mm. is actually very important. Whereas in theatre training, the sound of the emotion is more important. Mm. And that's quite an odd thing to say. Yeah. Um, and so, for example... Uh, in acting through song, you need to use a narrative tone of voice. And uh, we found that the idea of a speech quality or a speech-like quality was very useful, even though now we would always teach that on the basis of, well, this is uh, mechanism one, this is a chest mechanism. Mm. Uh, the way you deliver the words is much more speech-like. And I think it was very helpful at that time. Mm. They were like templates. That very much like templates. Yeah. And um, I will say that I wouldn't teach those sounds in that way now, no. simply because one develops a book, you know, that was written 20 years ago um, is obviously, in a sense, archival and your practice must develop. Can I bring Madonna in at this moment? Uh, if you like. <laughs> I have no idea what's about to happen. Um, it's the whole idea that when you write a book, it is essentially a snapshot of exactly where you are mm. at that point. Mm. And I'm thinking of Madonna. Madonna recorded Like a Virgin when she was 26, I think. She is now 61. It's quite likely that she still sings Like a Virgin, but she won't sing it in the same way that she sang it when she was 26. And quite how she works that into her show, I'm not sure, but it's always been a really popular song. Mm. So it's the idea that you have written a book in 2000, which is 20 years ago now, and it's still a really popular book. Mm. It is still on curricula. It's because of the process, and I think the process enables people to work in groups. Yeah. And I suppose what I'm saying is that you wouldn't write that book now like that and you wouldn't include some of the information that you did. No, and the, one of the reasons why I wouldn't include some of the information about how the voice works is because people know it now. Mm. It's there, it's available, you know, it's, it's gone into the psyche. I think as well that um, I wouldn't teach some of the soundscapes that an actor might explore in the same way. I would do it in a much more intuitive way. Mm. I think I'd probably uh, approach as well from spoken voice and the links between spoken and sung voice. You know, I really liked, um, can I give a little shout out for Joan Melton's book, With mm. One Voice? Mm. Uh, where she, again, she's working about um, an actor who needs to speak and sing and how do you move between the two? Just something that we're very interested in. Mm. And also, I think... Can I just say, we'll put uh, a link to Joan's book if I can yeah. find one. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. And also, I think helping an actor to find their musicality, which is something I used to do a lot in classes, but I didn't write about it in that book. And I think it's a really important part of the learning process. Can I digress for a moment on exactly that? Mm. Because this whole business of are you an actor, are you a singer, are you an actor, singer, are you mm. a singer, actor, mm. which in fact we talk about in the other book, 
Um, this whole thing about the language, your skill set, and what you are most comfortable communicating in, I think is what's important here. Mm -hmm. Because there are some actors who are superb at communicating in spoken word, and yet terrified of singing. And partly that's ability, partly it's technique, and partly it's a medium that they don't feel comfortable in. Whereas there are some actors who are completely comfortable in the singing mode and therefore can sell a song, can live within the singing genre, if you like. Mm. And it's very, it's one of the things that I do in my coaching sessions is to help people get comfortable communicating in something that might not be their primary mode. Mm. Mm. That's it. Yeah. So what happened next, Jeremy? Um, <laughs> we got married. We got married. We got married the same year. This is 2000. The book mm. came out. Uh, Singing the Actor first edition came out in 2000. We got married in 2000. We moved house in 2000. We did a lot in 2000. Mm, we did. It was a millennium year. Millennial year. It was a millennium baby. Mm. The, the book. Yeah. Do you want me to start you off? So, you know, not yes. content with having locked me in the kitchen and yeah. done all the cooking and, and, and the cleaning and all of those things and, and the support, to say nothing of having um, put me through the torture of reading my text aloud and saying, that doesn't work. Uh, yes. Which actually was a big favour. Yes. I love uh, doing that. Not content with that. Uh Jeremy decided that when ANC Black uh, approached yeah, they, me they, for a follow up, they book. wanted a follow up book. That's right. ANC Black wanted a follow up book because um, Singing in the Actor was so successful. And so um, we decided that, that, well, actually, it was about auditioning, wasn't it? Yes. And you decided. I said. Jeremy said, You can't write that book without me. There is no way that you can write a book on auditioning without me because at that point I'd done eight and a half thousand auditions in the mm. West End. Yeah. So and, I was, and you were right. And I was. You of were course. absolutely right. I love right. those yeah. words. Go on, say them again. <laughs> no, once is enough. Once is enough. All right. So successful you're singing on. auditions. You're um, on. Tell us, tell us about... Successful singing auditions things. was sort of more my book than yours, but we did write it together. Mm. Because I'd had so much experience of, writing, of, of working auditions, understanding them coaching for them, being in the West End and seeing what worked and what didn't and also seeing how actors dealt with what they were doing. Um, so that It's been a long time. I've just opened the book so he can see the chapters. We've actually, that was, we were writing that sort of 2001 mm, into mm. 2002. It was first published in 2002. Mm. I love this book and I really feel that it didn't get the audience quite that it needed. Um, it did all sorts of things for this one. So... Oh, can I? I love these. Just looking at, you know, we've got conscious learning. We've yeah, got these are making cha chapter titles: yeah. conscious learning, making decisions, making cuts, memorizing, and the audition countdown. Mm. I particularly want to talk about memorizing. I read it again just before we um, we did this uh, podcast, and my goodness, it's a good chapter. Mm. <laughs> there are so many things in the memorizing chapter that I went, well, I still do that. I still use those techniques, and actually, it's really well written. So they're very mm. clear what the what the the processes are to help people memorize and you memorize in different ways and uh, from my memory now mm. part of our process was that we wrote to musical directors and casting agents mm. and we said what is it that you're looking for because mm. i think this happens with all kinds of auditions but especially for actors are going through the audition process it can be very distressing you know what is it that they're looking for you know you maybe you get nine recalls mm -hmm. for a particular musical i've certainly had uh, clients do that with new musicals mm. and then suddenly you're kind of not in the running anymore and you've done the nine auditions mm. because you know the um the overall casting company came over from the us and decided they didn't like the people on the you know on the page currently yeah i talk a lot more about the recall the mm. whole sort of multiple recall system mm. in um in the new book uh, um why do i need a vocal coach mm. uh just about what the agents uh, casting agents and the uh, casting directors and the musical directors pretty much all said mm. was that what they're looking for is you 
Mm. They're looking for, I mean, yes, they want you to be able to sing the songs, and yes, they need you to be able to sing in tune. What they're most looking for is how do you bring that character to life? How do you bring that song to life? What is it about you that you bring into that song that's actually going to show? And so when people do auditions, they're very much looking for what standard are you? Are you comfortable on stage in general? Are you comfortable singing? Are you comfortable presenting that song? Are you comfortable doing that character? Have you made some good decisions? I think a lot of um, inexperienced actors and musicals, theatre singers, they're very much concerned with, oh, there's an industry sound, uh, particularly industry if it's a, a long-running show, which obviously we don't even have at the moment um, during the sort of the period of the um, pandemic. But And then feeling that they've got to sort of do something and make some kind of fit into it. In fact, that isn't really what the casting people want. It's not the case. First of all, there isn't uh, an industry sound. There are about 500 different industry sounds mm. because this industry, the musical theatre industry, more than I think any other um, music area, absorbs influences mm. really, really fast and then writes shows that contain more than one influence. Mm. That's the other thing, is that it's very rare for a show to actually sound all the music, all the songs sound in a similar style. Very often now, the writing will throw all sorts of different styles into the same musical, yeah. often the same character. So you're often having to sing in more than one style. Mm. Um, another chapter that I thought was really important, and I don't know uh, how often it's been covered in, in other books, which is about the casting. The cast, casting your voice. You know, are you being cast on your dramatic and physical capabilities? Because you're often cast on look, aren't you? Uh, look in, and energy, In theatre. Yeah. Remember, yeah. we're talking mostly about theatre here. And then what if your singing voice and your singing capabilities don't fit that casting? Oh, I love it. I had a, a website, I think it's still up there, mm. about um, auditioning, where my opening line is, um, uh, you look like Mary Poppins, but you sound like Madame Tenardier. You have a problem. Mm. Um, mm. Which I think is a lovely line. The, for this book, I created a quiz that is like one of those cosmopolitan <gasps> quizzes called the foal process, which is falling off a log. I think this this was one of the best chapters in the book, and this is your brainchild, wasn't Very it? Very much. Mm. It was one of those, because I quite liked doing quizzes at the time, and I thought, how could we do a quiz, sort of quiz, that would actually reveal something to yourself mm. about your own tastes, your own strengths, the things that you do so easily, it's like falling off a log, that other people go, wow, that's amazing, I wish I could do that mm. to which your answer is normally why can't you um which tells you that it's a falling off a log area mm. so I, I wrote this um i created this foal process the falling off a log process and it's very interesting i linked it to begin with with your your favorite flavors of comedy because i think that's very revealing what it is that you really enjoy and there are what makes you laugh what makes you laugh mm. what tickles your fancy um there are so many different types of comedy and once you start to identify what type of comedy or types of comedy you really like and particularly what you don't like because that's just as important what you really hate um i am mm. not a great slapstick fan unless it's mm. done really really well um but i love wordplay um so th there's all sorts of things in there and then uh, we went on to if my oh, by the way i had a supplementary question which i put in after this book was written uh, which is, if you were cast in a non-speaking role in a commercial, what would you be cast as? And when we work with groups of actors, because, um, you know, we often do successful singing audition workshops, mm, mm. we'll ask the, the actors to do this for each other. Yes. How would, how would you cast so-and-so? Why this is so mm. revealing is that it gives a real snapshot of you and your energy and your look and what people see in you without mm. you opening your mouth. And that says that is absolute typecasting to the way that you look. Typecasting has got a very bad press, but mm. it's actually really mm. useful because it tells you where your, if you like, your central area is in terms of energy casting, the sort of things that people will see you in when you walk in the room, and you work outwards from there. But I think the foal process is more than that because you're asking the individual 
to um, express in other terms so they're not thinking about their their singing capabilities or even their acting capabilities mm. but you're asking them to express uh, their likes their dislikes the things that attract them you know to do with their own kind of psychology mm. and their energy and you know actors are always worrying about finding the right song the song that will get the audition well of course there are millions of songs out there but if we'll you talk do, about that in a minute if you do the full process then you begin to see the songs that are going to fit you and that was why we wrote that chapter and it's interesting because it actually also fits with our understanding of voice which is mm. when you're when you're talking about being in business not to do with the show business but to be in business in general you're always told that you should work outside your comfort zone you should push your comfort zone you mm. should stretch your comfort zone mm. you should basically not be in your comfort zone because mm. then then you won't do anything and we think it's the opposite in both in casting and in um voice which is most of your work should be in your comfort zone because that's the stuff that you can do inside out, backwards, fall out of bed and do it. Well, what I'd say about casting is that, you know, the rehearsal process is the place where you stretch yourself yep. and uh, where you go out of your comfort zone. But in terms of, you know, if you're going for a first audition or a first meeting, Generally, what you want to do is something within your comfort zone that allows you to shine. I want to give an example of when it doesn't work. Um, I went to see a comedy in the West End, a very famous comedy with a very, very famous leading lady uh, who was cast in a comedy role. And she was a very, very famous dramatic leading lady. She had the comedy timing of a lump of wood and it was awful because she didn't understand how comedy worked. And therefore, every time she came on stage, the, the, the feel, the energy, the comedy just died because she couldn't match what was going on. And for me, that's, she was so far outside her comfort zone. That was miscasting then, that's in that mis respect. That's miscasting, yes. mm. absolutely. Um, and we see this happening in um, other situations, don't we? Mm. Oh, um. <laughs> we tend to digress so much we can't remember what we're yeah, saying yeah yeah is there anything that you would change about that book now jeremy yes um well yes and no i mean i'm going going to go back to madonna again in a way that is such a good snapshot of where i was and where we were mm. in 2002 mm. and there's actually in a way very little about the book that i've changed i think certainly the second half of it is really really strong mm. the thing that i might change certainly i'd want to update the references the song references yeah, and, and the, the show references mm. because musicals have moved on so much since 2002 mm. it was 18 years Mm. Um, the second thing I might change is we had a, a thing where we said um, categorise the musical and we had the Verismo musical the you know we had oh, various, we had our own little categories various yes. different types of musical and again I would probably yeah. change update that I might even take that chapter out completely mm. and do a much more extended chapter on how you take a song and work it for different auditions mm. And the reason I'm saying I'm not sure I would change it is because a lot of what I wanted to put into that has actually gone into the new book, into um, mm -hmm. Why Do I Need a Vocal Coach? Because mm -hmm. that is real, practical um, stories of lessons and what happens in lessons and how we morph songs for different processes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, what I would do, I see... Um, that the new book as really a sort of follow on from successful yeah. singing auditions, and I would say get both mm. because successful singing auditions was a real how to book from start to finish. Mm. And, um, why do I need a vocal coach? Is a is if you like more refined. I'm doing stuff that is much more specific, mm. it's much more tailored, it's much more contemporary. Mm. Does that answer your question? It does <laughs> answer my question, yes, <laughs> yeah. What about the writing process itself? Oh, let's let's you know. talk about writing. By the way, it's so funny that I should, I only realised this, it's so funny that I should pick Like a Virgin because we were both virgin book writers when we wrote this these books. I did wonder what you were going to say yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> the, we, the, um, six, uh, Singing in the Actor was your first book. It was my first book. And it was actually book. pretty much the first thing that you'd written in an extended way. Um, yes, it was. As a matter of fact, I always used to keep notes and I would make class notes and sometimes practice notes for my students and again that you know that became um some of the material that I put into the book um 
But I hadn't done an extended piece of writing since I was an undergraduate. Mm. My last piece of extended work before 2002 was as a my postgraduate. Yeah. yeah. So how did we learn to write? Um, <laughs> we just did it. Apparently, well, <laughs> it turns out we're quite good at it. Yeah. And I, again, I think having a good editor really, really helps. I do think it's important, even in a work of non-fiction, that you allow yourself to, you know, if it's not a, a research book, you allow yourself to find your own voice within the book. Very much. I think we both did that. Mm. Um, I think also we had a very strong structure to begin with. And then it was how do we put all the instructions that we have in our head, mm. how do we put them down? How do we actually describe what it is that we're, we're talking about? Because in both books, there was never going to be any audio. So it mm. has to be all written word. And in fact, mm. the same thing happened with This Is A Voice, uh, with The Welcome Trust in 2016. Mm. We were told that it was 99 exercises for voice training, but we would never have a video or a, a CD or, or MP3s or any sound files at all. So it all had to be spoken uh, written word. I tell you what, there is nothing like having to write it down to clarify your thoughts. Yes. It is, you know, it's a phenomenal process. And I think maybe... Reflecting on that, the fact that we have had to write about our practice mm. has made us, um, you know, has, has brought us to, it's made us really level up yes. with, with our, our, own, our own teaching, in-person teaching. When you know that something is going to be published, you have to decide that you're going to stand behind it. Yeah. And when you know that you can stand behind something, it does not matter what people say, you still know that what you wrote is good. Aha, uh -huh, you're going to reviews. Which brings me beautifully <laughs> to reviews. It's, you know, we're living in a very different cultural environment now, aren't we? Because, you know, we have Facebook and and we have YouTube and, um, you know, people get a lot of feedback uh, and people are maybe much more used to it. But, you know, when you write your first book, you feel quite vulnerable. Oh, it's like a child. And if you get a bad review, um, it can be really devastating. Devastating. And, we've and had, we have had some corkers. We've had good reviews and we've had bad reviews. There's one review still up on Amazon uh, for singing in the act of saying the book is dangerous because it talks about belting. Uh, on the other hand, there are some fantastic reviews of yeah. the book up there. Yeah. Um, yeah, you need. You had a thing about about types of reviews, and I really thought this was lovely. Yeah. And I wish we'd known this in two thousand yes, and in two thousand two. Quite. I, I know. I mean, I had one review that that really, really shocked me, and I, I won't go into details. But uh, when I reported it to my editor, she said, "Now there are reviews, and there are character assassinations. Ignore this one because it's the second. Mm. And now reflecting there are reviews that really kind of you know someone's actually read the book and they're able to put it into a context and reflect on it and say something sensible about it uh including a critique i mean if i do a review of a book i i will normally make some critique at some point mm. to be honest if i hate the book i won't review it I've only ever done I that once. I know you once. did it once, yeah. It was a commission. I was asked to review a mm. book by a magazine and I had a real problem with it because it was so... Well, I'm going to use the word arrogant. And yet I, there was still some good stuff in yeah. it and I still said And you so. look for the good stuff. Yes. So, yes, there's a reflective review, um, there's character assassination and sometimes, look out for this, those of you who are um, publishing... Sometimes people use the review for personal promotion, Their as own. in, oh, I, I could really, I could do this a lot better. Um, you know, we all do this, don't we? Yes. And we all do this far think, better than is written in Well, then book. write your own book, Sunshine. Yeah, where's yours? So uh, that brings me to a kind of final <laughs> question, which is why write a book? Yeah. Why? Well, I can tell you that it's not for the money. <laughs> no, non-fiction books you do not write for the money. No, absolutely not. I think it's because it has to be said. Oh, totally. There's something that you have to put out there, even though it's a work of non-fiction. It is a creative act. Everything 
I think that we've published um, 18 webinars. Every one of those webinars, I've said, let's do it because. And we always mm. have a because. And the because is this information needs to get out in some way because mm. in sometimes we're counteracting some total bullshit that's out there. And sometimes it's because, oh, I understand this. I understand how it works. And I just like to share it with people. Mm. Mm. So if someone does approach you and suggest that you write a book, make sure that it's something you really, really want to share with the world. Mm. I can tell you that I've been approached more than once to uh, turn my PhD into a book. And I'm going to be quite honest and say, in my experience, people who turn their PhDs into books generally produce something that is rather deadly. There are only a very few exceptions that I've seen. Um, I'm writing a foreword for one uh, right now, actually. Mm. I didn't want to do that because I thought, well, I'm going to be bored doing it. And that means the reader's going to be bored uh, reading it. And I don't want to do that. I, think... I would rather get the core information about my own doctoral research out there in a different form, which we do in our teaching. I think the format is really important mm. because with a PhD, it has a particular target. It has a particular goal in mind. And when you then publish it as, a, as, a, as a, a textbook or a novel or a book or whatever, mm. the goal is different and actually the target audience is different. And unless you can rewrite it to get to that tar new target mm. audience, it's deadly. It needs a lot of morphing. So no offence to my fellow uh, doctoral uh, singing <laughs> pedagogues, uh, but I'm sure you found it quite a hard process making that switch between the, the thesis and the book and I decided I wasn't going to do it. It's been interesting for us in the whole writing career because right up to between singing and the actor, successful singing auditions, the Singing Express series, This Is A Voice, all of those were commissions. Mm. So we were mm. asked to write them. It wasn't until I did How, um, How, How to Sing, sing Legato mm. was the first one and that was a, a beautiful example of I have been working on this genuinely for about seven years. It was born out of desperation, it that book. It was born out of desperation because <laughs> there is so much crap talked about uh, legato, and I just mm. went, it's so straightforward, please can we do this? Mm. But it, another, another example of me sitting on the pot and not being able to get off it. That's why eventually we seven published years. it. Seven years. We published it, and we published it ourselves. So in, a, in essence, I commissioned myself to mm. do it. And that does have its advantages, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is perhaps a very neat segue into talking about our sponsors yes. for today. So the sponsor for today is Canny Publishing, and Canny Publishing is the publishing arm of Vocal Process. Mm. Canny is spelled C-A-N-U, so it looks like can you, but in fact is a Welsh word for to utter, to speak, to sing, to pronounce, to orate, <clears throat> to give poetry. It's a hugely mm. um, I love it. varied word, mm. uh, pronounced canny. And uh, the book that, obviously, I've mentioned it a few times, which is Why Do I Need a Vocal Coach, which is the latest one. And as I said, I think it's the follow-up to Successful Singing Audition. It's a lovely book. Yeah. Mm. So, um, by the way, if you've got any of the books that we've mentioned, um, uh, please will you go and put uh, reviews of them on YouTube. We are on YouTube, on Amazon, on anywhere you like. Preferably not a character assassination, oh, okay? Well, the thing is that we have, <laughs> thank you, we already have enough character assassinations over the years. Um, but if you can do us a reflective review, mm. that would be brilliant. Mm. Um, and or tell us your experience yeah. of, of the book and how you've been using it. We'd love to know. Yes. So I think we're done. Mm. Um, we are on uh, YouTube. Oh, by the way, this is a, a little shout out for the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel has been fairly dormant for a couple of years, mm. but I've just started uploading two new series. Somebody asked us for the videos that went with This Is A Voice. Now, just to explain that, when we wrote the book and we were right almost at the end of the final editing process, mm. we'd all been told all along that we're going to be no videos, no audio, no nothing. And they were so pleased with the manuscript that they said, actually... This is the Welcome, the Welcome Foundation. Foundation th we're going to provide a budget for you to film mm. some videos. Mm. And so we were brought in on the... This is very bizarre. The Welcome filmed the videos and we were brought in on our own book to be consultants, which is slightly weird. That yeah, was good. It was very and, good. Uh, and we had two actors and we, had, and we actors. had a lot of fun. We did. And so the Welcome have released two 
of the series, which mm. is one unspoken voice and a series on beatboxing. Mm. And um, somebody requested about three weeks ago that they couldn't find them and, and did I have them? And I thought, actually, yes, I do. So they're now on our YouTube they channel. They are now being uploaded as we speak onto the YouTube channel. I think, I can't remember how many are up there already, mm. but I think they're going up until, I think there's another couple to go up. So if you're keen to see a few of those exercises demonstrated, go yes. there. We will uh, we will do a podcast where we talk about the other books, won't we, and, yes. and that process. But yes. we, we wanted to start at the beginning. Yes. With the stories behind the stories. Where it all started. So um, check out the YouTube channel, which is Vocal Process. Check out Facebook, which is Vocal Process. Check out Twitter, which is mm. at Vocal Process. And sign up to our newsletter, which is vocalprocess.co.uk. Now, we haven't used any AMAs for this podcast, but we love your AMAs. Yes. Can you tell them where they can submit them? Please do. Please record your AMAs because we'd love mm. to hear your voice uh, actually asking us and so if you go on to speakpipe.com slash vocal process and you can record questions for us and we will play them in the podcast mm. so that's brilliant we are done I think so um, we will see you next time over and out yeah bye 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 <laughs>